So with that, we're going to turn it over to Bill James. And Bill, let you introduce yourself and go into your presentation. Ben, you can make it today. Uh, thanks. And um, so I'm going to go over the technology. I've done this presentation once before here, uh, but I'll still go through the technology so that we get on the common field. And then I want to talk to you about the business structure of this thing. Um, uh, I was talking with Ed earlier. I would like the community here to form a company. And if it does, I'll give it, make it a, that company, a co-founder in the Oklahoma mobility company that will build these networks in Oklahoma so that you guys get some skin in the game. Okay. All right. So if you think of the internet as a distributed collaborative computer network that moves data packets, my patent is on the use of distributed collaborative computer networks to move physical packets. So we're going to move people and freight around the city just like railroads move containers, okay? Right now, traffic costs the people of Texas about $1.7 billion a year. 69% of those costs are urban. And our niche is the is dense, highly repetitive urban transportation of people and cargo and payload less than 500 kilograms or half a ton. Okay, our team, we got Charlie Fletcher was the commanding general of the Army Transportation Command. He's also the commanding general for logistics for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, David and um, Don, and we got a whole crew that's pretty, pretty good talent here. Um, the objective is within 12 months, we want to open the first network. And I signed an agreement this week with Atoka, Oklahoma, and they want to include this with their drone program. So they've got the drone program up in the in the Choctaw uh, Nation area. We're going to put a solar factories up there and our certification guideway. And that's it. All right. So this is Okay. So the two two key components of my patent is. Robots on great separated guideways, and then to use the structure of the guideways to deploy the solar collectors to gather the energy to power it. And then here I brought a little unit here that's a solar collector and, a, and fuel cells that electrolyze water to hydrogen and oxygen, store it, and then another fuel cell takes and drives this motor. And if we set it outside, it'll start it up and it'll run when we get a vent. And I talked to John. John's company is coming out with a new set of oxide uh, fuel cells that can operate at high temperatures, which is one of the things that we wanted on our on our shopping list. So uh, I expect that we will become big buyers of anybody that does anything in IoT or energy storage. Okay, so. Freight railroads, 140,000 miles of freight railroads in the U.S., average 470 ton miles per gallon. So if we can move a ton at 400 miles per gallon, why are we moving a 200-pound person 188 times less efficient than 25 miles per gallon? That is the scale of the savings that we can generate. Okay, and I'm just going to talk about this. So this whole concept of Electrically powered self driving cars is a half a century old. Here's Walter Cronkite covering Trisha Nixon. President Nixon, it was so important President Nixon sent his daughter Trisha to open this network. And they talked about here's the old concept of people movers one man, one car, and several traffic games per day. And overhead, they're building a new system. And here is a self driving car. 1972, and imagine what, and, and on 1972 computers, and they didn't upgrade them until about 19, in the early 2000s, they finally upgraded them. So anyway, we've, we've known this is the solution to urban traffic problems since 1972. 1975, a congressional study was done to find solutions to the 73 oil embargo. Oh, they talk about it's, a, it's an up to an hour drive, on buses, and it's four minutes on this great separated guideway. So um, the key thing 
to do in how many of you had a Motorola Razor cell phone? Okay, it was a spectacularly well engineered device on the analog network. When Apple came out with the iPhone in 2007, it basically wiped out the Razor's market. All right, everything is being done with self driving cars right now, where we're doing 300 mile range self driving cars. I think it's going to be significantly displaced because it's a digital device on the analog road. JPods are a digital device on a digital network. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So it's 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 a it's it's the and since that's 69 percent of the market, that's going to be a pretty big deal. And we AAA says we spend about ten thousand dollars a year to own a car that's parked ninety five percent of the time. When you turn transportation into a service. Now you don't have to own your car. You just get in a golf cart, go down to the end of the corner, or walk to the end of the corner, pop into one of these, get across Dallas, and and then take a scooter to the last quarter mile, and you're there. So the, here's the saving. If you are riding on a freight train in your car, it's a penny a mile. That's how efficient freight railroads are. Mass DOT data says they spend a buck 45 per passenger mile for buses, 76 cents a mile for car, uh, trains, and AAA says we spend 80 cents a mile per car, but we've got 1.57 people per car, so 38 cents a passenger mile. We're three cents a passenger mile. That's what happens when you remove all the start stops and you move, you hang it, so you grade separate to remove the start stops, you flip it over and hang from it, to remove the parasitic mass. Now, instead of a two-ton car, you've got a you've got a 500-pound pod that can move uh, 1,200 pounds of payload. And in terms of capital costs, so it's not just operating costs. The average light rail in the U.S. is 202 million dollars a mile. We're 20 million. Well, we're and, and we're 20 million dollars a mile. I think we got 15 million dollars a mile in here, but we upped it the other day. To $20 million just so we have a little bit of wiggle room. So these will be built at a fraction of a tenth the cost of building light rail and operating at a tenth to a fiftieth of the cost of current transportation network. And you can stop me anytime you want and ask what yes sir. I'm old enough to, re to, re to remember when Max Goldblatt was city was made city councilman here in Dallas. He was pushing to set up a monorail system in Dallas, basically the same system using the easy right of ways. So everybody laughed at him, made, made, made fun of him. And yet, Disney at that time was uh, moving over 2 million people a year uh, through Disneyland in Orlando. And he explained to me the uh, he drew out his plan on back of the cocktail map and said, This is to put T bars up, uh, made it pre thumbed out of concrete, and do that. My question is, how are you going to overcome the uh, political uh, stubbornness, you know, I call it, that people don't want it because there's too much money to be made. If you own a building that's at a main traffic stop in Valley, say, on DART, you're worth a lot more than if your system, you go up and down the, the highway, you're, uh, you don't add, any, you don't add you know, millions of dollars of value to, it, to a particular building. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how do you plan on overcoming all right. That obstacle. all right, so, all right, and this is a 25 year civics lesson. So 1998, I was talking to some of my classmates that studied, we studied nuclear engineering together, and we looked at it and we said, I've been in the infantry, and we've been fighting oil war since 1991 and done nothing to get off foreign oil. So that's how long we've been working at this. And this congressional study that was done in 1975 identified exactly what you're saying as the solution for urban transportation and that Morgantown was the solution, and that institutional failure at the federal government had blocked such innovation for four to six decades, and that was 48 years ago. So this, the, the hard thing to do, or the, the thing we've come to realize is that we create governments for the very important purpose of minimizing war and crime by coercing compliance with law. Does that make sense? Innovation is a compliance failure. 
So when governments control a sector of the economy, you get a century of rotary telephones and a century of the 25 miles per gallon efficiency of the model. They even replaced 46% of 400 ton miles per gallon railroads with 25 miles per gallon roads. So overcoming that has been a 25 year effort. Last September, the North Central Texas Coalition of Governments voted to approve JPUS to start building, but we have yet to get TxDOT to grant us. And what we want to use is the ASTM F24 regulations for, for safety that Six Flags uses for their great separated rides, but we have not gotten Texas to agree to that yet. But this week, Atoka, Oklahoma said yes and signed papers. And so we will start building a certification guideway up there. And then once we get that certification guideway in place, my guess is all those barriers, regulatory barriers, start walking away. Okay. But it, it is so hard. Governments, government, and it's, it's not, it's people think that it's somebody's vested interest. No, it's just governments are just don't change. They coerce compliance with law. They don't innovate. All right, so here's a bunch of the other 10x benefits of this. You get a 10x operating cost, a 10x uh, reduction in capital cost. You've got, all right, so let's take a train with a thousand people moving every six minutes, you get 6,000 people an hour. We can put 28,000 people an hour down a guideway, traveling at a half a second. So two meters, three meters between vehicles. Um, Freight costs, yeah. so we can move freight in cities at very close to freight railroad efficiencies. And Chris's girlfriend does Uber freight. And I think we're gonna end up being the middle mile in the freight from the airport to somewhere near your business. And then somebody's gonna pick it up from a UPS or a FedEx office and deliver it the last half mile to mile. Um, energy safety. Real rides have 3.7 injuries per million. Department of Transportation has 11,200 injuries per million. So you get a 3,000 times improvement in safety also. So safety is not the problem. Cost isn't the problem. Goldman Sachs has given us a letter of interest relative to putting four to six billion dollars in these networks. Um, access to rights of way is the only barrier. And we need to bring these to Central and South America too. I've, I met with the president of Guatemala and I met with the president of Haiti about this. And once we break the regulatory barrier or the rights of way barriers here, I think this sort of stuff will start getting distributed out across every city that has traffic problems. Okay, so here's the safety difference on this um, 3.7 injuries per million versus 11,200. So Morgantown. This is the Morgantown system. It looks a lot like what was at DFW until they replaced it with the air trains. All right. Um, it has had five minor injuries in half a century. So in that same period, 1.8 million Americans have been killed on roads with 2.4 million serious injuries a year. So safety is not the barrier. Only access to rights of way. And then what we do is we put many stations out across an area. So uh, my guess is it will not be long before most major hotels will want stations in their lot. Grocery stores, we talked to Kroger, they want a station at the back to deliver groceries and a station at the front to deliver customers. So here is an example of the land use. It, it, it's got a trivial footprint, so we can put this into existing rights of way very easily. There's an example of guideways that are good to uh, California earthquake standards, and and they have to be high enough that we don't have to have signage that trucks can pass under us. And relative to accessibility. The COG did a survey, and one of the huge questions was, um, what do pedestrians and bike riders do? And um, take all these linear barriers, like 75, that just are just stop commerce on each side. You get in your car to drive across the busy road, 
that would have been a perfectly fine walk. So when we build this between four corners around a freeway, where you've got two freeways crossing, you park in one place, you could go around the whole shopping area without having to get back into your car. These are the kind of, and those areas where you've got shopping on, on being broken by linear barriers tend to be the highest accident areas in a city. So once we start building these networks to solve those traffic problems, the accident rates will probably go down. And then here's freight. We can move. My guess is that we will end up being 60% of the middle mile freight hauling in cities of standard freight. We can't do oversize, but if it can fit inside a pallet or two and be less than 500 kilograms or half a ton, we can haul it cheaper than any other mode. And think of this as a just-in-time engine that moves. So down in the lower right, you'll see Kiva. So Kiva got a $18 million investment in 2003, 2002, and then sold themselves to Amazon for $775 million in 2012. That's a 45 uh, return time to return on investment. That's the scale of what happens when you automate freight and we're just doing it on the scale of a city instead of a warehouse. <clears throat> so you'll see trucks parked a lot when they're taking a couple of pallets or a couple of, you know, a, a 40 foot van pulls up at a McDonald's and delivers two pallets of a hamburger bun. That's an enormous waste of energy and resources. So what we do is we streamline that. Now, we have software that allows you to design these things and illustrate them in 3D or in Google Earth. And this is available free to anybody. So anybody that wants to be a co-founder in the city that you live in, you pull down our free software, start designing networks or kids. We're going to create an army of 16-year-old hackers that design networks for their cities. And then we give them shares in the company that that will eventually own and operate the network in their city, okay? So this software is free and online. So is our route time software. So here is an example of what route time software would look like calculating the number of vehicles we need and the capacity at DFW. So DFW, the car rental is separate from the air train. And they're also separate from DART on the south side. When we build a network that connects the airport to car rental to DART on the south side, the value of the north side DART becomes much more valuable because now all the services that, that could get you to the airport get you to, this, to car rental or to the terminal or wherever you need to go. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. <clears throat> One of my pet peeves for years has been DFW is probably one of the worst airports on traveling to probably most of the major U.S. airports for public transportation. You go into Atlanta, you don't even need the terminal, and I can get on MARTA and go basically anywhere in the city. And yet, dark forces me living in North Dallas. I've got to zigzag and take some kind of uh, buses or trains or whatever. To go all the way downtown to the station, wait an hour or two, and go out and then finally go out to the airport. And it's worse than me trying to go with one of those shuttle services where you've got to uh, pay three hours ahead of time to the flight to be able to get there on time. And yet, you look at stats, and this, this came from Ray Hutchinson, who's the dean of the uh, municipal bonds in Texas. 80% of the onboarding traffic at DFW comes from North Dallas. Yeah, DART makes it, you know, ugly. Yeah. It, it's stupid. It's stupid. It's, it's a perverse piss incentive to do it. What's the probability of you guys getting on and running across, say, LBJ or George Bush and go out? I'm, we're, we're pushing that. I My guess is that within four years, you'll see a mesh network. All right. So we're going back here to. 
it's silver lines already in progress. So, yeah, yeah silver, the silver line. line yeah. Right, and I, we don't say anything. I, I reticence. All right. This is DART. It's all linear networks. Okay. It's a hub and spoke. Exactly what you're saying. Okay. The prime law of networks is that the value of a network, and you'll see Metcalf's law on this too. The, the, the value of a network goes up exponentially based upon the number of interconnected nodes. DART has their nodes, but they've got a hub and spoke. When we start crossing these hubs, these spokes, and we make a mesh network out of this thing, the value of DART will go up. But we'll also, my guess is, every two square miles, every two miles across North Dallas, across Plano, across um, <clears throat> Frisco, everywhere, you'll be within a mile of getting on a j station. And that will make it so that you go point to point. So you don't go into city. These are a packet switch network. You don't do with strangers. It's just like Uber or a chauffeured car. In fact, next time you get in an elevator and push the button, you're riding in a vertical J bus. These are just a network of four dollar elevators. There's nothing complicated except for access to rights. So does that make sense? No. Yeah, so the, the, this this whole idea that you've got to come down to the center of the city is is just enormously wasteful. It's horrible. So here is the MOU, and anybody that gets an MOU signed in the city, you get to be a co-founder that owns the network in that city. I'm really serious about this thing. And like uh, I laid out Frisco the other day. And it's a $2.4 billion network with a five year payback. All right. These things are just, they, you, we are so wasteful. We're moving 188 times less efficient than we know is practical. All right. So here's what a Kitty Hawk network looks like. So this will make this little certification guideway and it's just a station and some vehicles and a traffic circle and with this department of energy once we get that first network certified department of energy has we've had a couple conversations with them they're pretty well interested in lending us somewhere between 400 and 800 million dollars to build out these networks and supply chains in north texas so the capital is available. Goldman Sachs gave us a letter of interest. And then about two months later, they came out with a statement that they want to put 750 billion into sustainable infrastructure projects by 2030. So there's plenty of money available if we can get access to rights of way. So here are things are think about we, this is what happened in 196, 1913, the 17th Amendment. Gave the federal government removed the Senate states uh, as um, represented in the Senate. And that consolidated an enormous amount of power in the federal government. So in 1918, um, 1916, the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1916 began the federal government's violating the post route restriction in Article 1, Section 8, and no preferences clause in Article 1, Section 9 to build highways. There's 21 that no that post roads restriction was put in there because Dr. Franklin, the guy with the kite, proposed that the federal government be enumerated power to tax to build highways and canals in the federal convention. And then George Mason reminded him of the Boston Tea Party was a demonstration against the general government's transportation monopoly that triggered a war. And they voted eight states to three to forbid the federal government from taxing to build highways and canals. And there's 21 presidential veto messages enforcing that until 1916. And it was 1916 since the federal government has mandated 25 miles per gallon efficiency of the Model T. 1918, Wilson monopolized the equations under an executive order, and we ended up with most of the century of rotary telephones until the courts declared that monopoly unconstitutional in 1982. 
and we went from rotary telephones to Star Trek. Okay, same thing's going to happen now that we've broken the regulatory barriers with transportation. You're going to see J pods, Hyperloop, and just a plethora of these grade separated guideways that are digital networks, transportation networks. Okay, so key dates back in the Boston Tea Party all the way to the COG and then Atoka granting us right away to start building now. And here's a bunch of news articles. And, and, and you can look at these. We've already crossed the tipping point. This is like the internet in 1992, in that it had already passed its tipping point, but most people didn't realize it yet. All right. And I, I put this in here just because it, it's. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, all right. It's going to be a little too choppy. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, all right, so this is 1994. Allison, what is the internet anyway? It's a, it's a really cute video because they were talking about this app sign. What is this app sign? Now, probably most of us had emails before that point in time, but an awful lot of people did not. And they were wondering, what is the internet anyway? This is my marker for when the internet became widely understood that this was going to be there, okay? So, and then here is another video that I'll send you the link to if you're interested in. It's the mother of all demos, 1968. If you start at minute 30 you'll, and watch for four minutes, you'll watch them do video conferencing, clicking on URLs, using a mouse to click on URLs, okay, 1968. So we had the technology for the internet in 1968, but it was not until 1982 that it became legal to compete with the government monopoly. Okay. People will say, well, it was the internet was created by DARPA, and that's kind of the very definition of a, of a monopoly is that only those people inside the monopoly are allowed to innovate. But DARPA did not commercialize it. It wasn't until we put it back into free markets. In fact, to take a little bit of West Point pride, is 1983, Frank Caulfield invested in what became AOL and asked Jim Kimsey to run it and, and or be the chairman of it. And they flooded the world with you've got mail discs yes. forever. And they just counted it in until everybody had an email. And, that, and, and between email and the porn industry, the internet hit a tipping point. So that's an interesting thing. All right, so now let's go back. Because I want to talk about the business side of this thing because I'd like you guys all to form a company and I'll give it some equity in there so that you can watch it and participate and, and be aware of whether it's got value or not of a first-hand basis. So the way we build this is we're going to build it just like the transcontinental railroads were built and just like the internet was built. All right, you had Cisco making routers. That's what JSON did. Then you had the telcos providing community networks. And then you had this vast array of ISPs. There was an ISP on every corner. Okay, they were just flooding out there. And so what we do is we build with these, what we call a master mobility company. So the construction is done here. Every week, whatever is built that week, is sold to an operating company. So the Texas company will construct the networks, the Frisco company will own Frisco, the Rich, the um, um, uh, Richardson company will own the networks in Richardson, and each of these things will be, you know, $2 billion networks. I mean, it, it, these networks are gonna be pretty big. So nothing like it in the world is a really good case study to look at this. You want to see how this gets done. And if you want to see agile thinking in extremely well executed, they started out, it took them 35 years to get the regulatory framework correct. In 1862, they passed that regulatory framework. 
but it had an onerous capital requirement for the federal that the federal government had first lien on everything. They fixed that 1864, 1865, 25 miles were built. By 1869, they had built nine that uh, 1,911 miles. So once you get ramped, they were building at the rate a man could walk. Okay, things were coming in just in time to be assembled. And that's what, so if you're a supplier, uh, if you want to, if we were, we were going to be a major buyer of everything IOT. Now, we are also under a significant gun. It normally takes, well, think about the internet. 1968, the text was all there. 1982, and I count 2007 when we shifted to set digital cell phones as being that, that, so that's about 35 years that we've worked on this thing. Normally it takes 40 to 200 years to shift to major infrastructure. We are in enormous trouble relative to oil. The Dallas Fed did a survey of uh, 153 oil companies in September last year. 85% agree. And, and we were talking earlier, I don't even agree with myself 85% of the time. Okay, the fact that 85% of oil company executives believe we will have supply problems in 2024 is a pretty strong endorsement that we are going to be back in the situation we were in 2008 by 2024, 25, 26. So we have a pretty short fuse on a really big bomb. And here's the background data. So investment is rig count. And the current price of oil was created by that rig count back between 2010 and 2015. Rig count collapsed in 2015, and then a little bit came up, but it's still way below what is required to sustain 12 million barrels a day of production. So right now we're consuming ducks, the drilled uncompleted wells are being consumed. And by 2024, Rick count it has dictated that by 2024 we're going to be in supply drop. Okay, and then here's a larger graph of peak oil and debt, national debt and foreign oil. So anyway, we've got to get our supply chains under our own feet. So everything we can do to move all the chip manufacturing into the U.S. The solar manufacturing 60 percent is in China right now. We need to get that under our own feet. So the problem, you can go see the problem every time you get out and you commute, okay? We know the solution for 50 years. It's great separated driveways of self-driving cars. Here's a picture of 1900. There's one car, or there's one car in this picture in 1900. 1913, there was one horse and buggy in the Easter Day Parade in, in New York City. It's possible to make changes fairly quickly if we're really aggressive. And the fact that we can use so much technology to leverage this shift gives us an advantage. So I'd love to have you guys on a, involved in this change. So what questions you got? Would you talk about the network that Plano already has planned at Legacy West? Yeah, yeah. all right. So. When the, after the COG approved that we could build, they asked cities to request networks. Arlington, Plano, and Las Colinas requested networks. Plano wants to build a um, network that looks. Oh, if you go to jpodstx.com, you can see this stuff. Here is the network on Legacy West, all right? Um, and, and this is a really interesting point. Since we were approved, the COG has approved Swift City, which is a Google, Gerald, it's, it's some guys out of Google, okay? They're not part of Google, but they use Google's name a lot, okay? 
Plano right now is trying to decide whether they want to use JPods or, or Swift cities. Okay. My point to everybody is we didn't change from horses to cars by Detroit having one company. We didn't change from rotary telephones to the internet by the Silicon Valley having one tech. What they should do is allow every company that can fund a project to start building in these cities and let it be a commercial race. That's what was done with the Transcontinental Railroad. They made, they made it a race. And if we do that, then it becomes a matter of, we can create a, an industry that creates a, a cluster. So we need to be here. We need the motor manufacturers to be here. We need the IOT experts to all be here. We need this whole network to congeal into an industrial cluster. Does that make sense? Is there an interest in having inter, uh, what is it? Uh, well, compatib yeah, interconnections. Compatibility the of networks. Interoperability. All right, interoperability. interoperability. All right, so, yeah. so think about interoperability. The minute you focus, right, so uniformity and excellence are mutually exclusive. Right? If you're uniform, you're barely average. So in the beginning, you should have divergence. Then you come back and you find out what works by probing different things. And then the industry will bring it back into a standard. And then you can diverge again. So we, we did this with from eight track tapes and, and CDs to, to scud to drive to cell phones. You, know, you need both. You need, all right. So from my point of view, two aspects of liberty intertwine to create the general welfare. Tolerance of disruptive minorities offering choices and tolerance of people sorting those choices in free markets and free speech. So customers are <laughs> ruthless about their self-interest. So if you diverge into an area that's not in their self-interest, they have no trouble at all killing you off to buy somebody else's stuff. Okay? So it is in our interest as, as commercial people to both diverge to see if we can't please a niche market and then congeal back and diverge and then converge back on the best standards at that time. And then it's an incremental change over time that gives you, that goes from 300 baud to gigabit transfers on the internet. So the problem I have with that is the value is the network. The value is staying within the network. It's not going from one city, getting off, going into another city, having to wait five minutes, whatever, for the next spot. That gets me now into Irving. Now I've got to go from Irving into this network that may be a DFW. I've got to wait. So there's no value for me to get in Plano, traverse through four different networks. And by that point, I've just as well taken a bus, a train, or whatever, and use the current system we're at today. And that's my concern with a non-standard connection, let's say within Metroplex. It doesn't matter what Austin's doing, I don't care what Houston's doing, but my concern is the value of traversing from one side of the network through the various different companies per se, under that mindset, and the value of actually arriving at the other end. I just wanna get in, take a nap and wake up where I wanna, where the final destination per se. So my concern is the fact that there isn't at least some transfer mechanism to get from one network to another. I have no problem with competition. That's beautiful and you know, a monopolistic mindset. But I think the value is staying in your pod, owning your pod, as you've said before, putting it on the network and going to DFW. Yeah, you might, you, I'm, I'm gonna guess that there will be some interplay between that all right, but if you start out saying that everything has to be interoperable, then you're going to argue over which is the best choice at each thing in the beginning. It's better to put it into operation in niches, like let's say around this four corners of this parking, of this linear barrier where Sam Rayburn crosses 75. Well, I think a beautiful example is uh, Legacy West and uh, Shops of Legacy. Right. That's beautiful. I mean, I park my car on one side of the highway or the tollway, whichever, 
and I go do what I want to do. Right. And so I want to have dinner over here and go dancing over here and shopping over there. I'm all on the same network. Right. And so that's they, beautiful. And, and, and let, let things diverge for a while. There's more than enough traffic problems in Plano or any of these cities to allow multi, when let me put it this way. When there is a shortage of congestion and traffic problems, then the government should ration who gets to build where. But until there's a shortage of problems, let each vendor go find a niche and go solve <laughs> niche problems. And then let's see what the industry rolls out. The main problem as I see it is nobody wants to be the nobody seems to want to be the pioneer in this thing. And going back, reflecting on one of your previous prior statements, you know, customers with act in their own self-interest, me and ran type of thing. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. My question to you is dealing with governments, like I, like I said, I definitely got to know Max Global really, really well. I believe Monterey would have been saving us millions, if not billions. Why not go to somebody like Trammel Crow, who's got a hell of a lot of skin in the game with uh, two or 3,000 hotel rooms at the Anna Hall? His job is to keep that above 70, 80 percent occupancy. Man, they do a lot of conventions. Come and you're not going to be local, they're going to be national, meaning they're going to fly in the DFW. Why not hit up somebody like him? Yeah, you help me get that done, and let's go do it. I'll give you shares in the company that owns that network. Well, I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah, he's got all those thousands of rooms, right? Yeah, tons of tons of parking. He's his. His self interest is to fill up that hotel. Right. If it goes, it's Friday night. If a room goes unsold, it's zero revenue to him. Right. He's and, still got the expenses and no revenue. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I don't know if you remember the story when the uh, was it the Western at the Galleria first opened up. I don't know if you were here in, in Dallas at the time. No. Okay. Don could even run out that that far north, and they had a couple of women. Would you end, uh, pick up, get a cab at DFW and say, take me to the best hotel in North Dallas. If they took, if they took the women to uh, the, the Western Gallery in the first few months it was open, they got an extra $20 test. Out. Right. And that's how they got people because I mean, they, the Western was actually paying Florida extra to bring up all of their you know, hotel needs, bus boys, and all the you know, low paid help up to there. Why not go to like the the major hotels. I, mean, I, I have I have talked to them a bit, but so again, they haven't been able to get the governments to break the right of way barrier either. But now that we get it and we get that network up and Atoka certified, I think we will be. Air Force are one of my is our favorite market. Single, no question asked, the yeah. best market for these networks to start building niches in, where you connect hotels to car rental to parking to to terminals. To, air, to trains and the inner uh the environmental impact statement for the air train in LaGuardia from Willett Station to the number seven train to LaGuardia says J Pods and other PRT, they list us by name with other PRT companies, personal rapid transit, um, as technically qualified. And then they inflated our cost from $20 million a mile to a billion dollars a mile to select the air train. Okay. And now the local community there working with us helped kill the air train. So we're back in it. So as soon as I get this a token network certified, my guess is we're building from Willett Station to LaGuardia and then from Willett Station to Jamaica Station, then JFK and, and LaGuardia would be connected by guideways. And I think that the same thing, well, Dave and I have had a talk with, with DFW and they just don't want to be first. It's, it's what you said. It, all right, Martin Lauer, the guy that built the PRT system in Heathrow, he died shortly thereafter, and they lost their driving force. So it has not expanded outside of that little network in Heathrow. He had a cute saying that there's an infinite number of cities that want to be first at being third. <laughs> Following up on that, why not go to some of the some of the major colleges they've got young kids i don't know how school. to i don't know how to get up. all right morgantown has had that network since 1972 
and even getting Morgantown to expand their network has been very difficult. Academ academics aren't aren't very driven for innovation. It, is that is that run by the city or the university? Or it's run by the city university. It's now I've got a letter from the mayor of Morgantown trying to get the mayor of College Park to let us build in College Park, Maryland. The the the, the city, but getting again. You know, in institutions are not are very complicated to get rights of way from. Just very okay. Complicated. okay, so it's university. So if I uh, pick up the horn and call Jordan D and say yeah. you want more money into the university, you don't have to go out to all these stupid fundraisers. Right. And and we'll fund we'll fund building it. We'll we'll bring the money to build it. Network. We'll build the money at at well at UTD. We'll build the network. All right. The money is available if we can get access to right away. And one of the things I would like your help with specifically is um, there are tax credits, and there will be tax um, in, and maybe even um, payments for people buying an electric car and owning solar panels, but. That doesn't apply to a lot of people who live in apartments and people who can't afford a car. What I'd like to be able to do is have them buy a pie, a J-Pod. And I and I had a conversation with Chat GDP on this. And, and we would call our pods would technically qualify, is that we let them buy a pod and then they lease it back to us and we run it on the guideway. And now we're making capitalists out of all these people living in, in apartment complexes. And they own the solar panels over our guideway, and we buy the electricity from them, and they get dividends. So it's a way to make capitalists out of regular people. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I love about what I hear is um, based in reality, so to speak. Even the way you want to standardize it, which is important, but if you build it. You're building something that would really work other than going and impose it and then finding out that there were things that would have been better done in a different way. So that patience of building it is very wise, it seems to me, for any kind of project that affects the entire population in a you know, like a place like a city. Mm -hmm. Now I have a practical question related to the lifestyle. Thinking, yeah. you know, okay. wherever we live, we see our surroundings. I get to see the sky. And so, why are we going to be seeing from, you know, the human level? Because all these photographs show us the earth, you know, the bird view. But if I'm standing here and I'm surrounded by this network, what am I going to be looking at? Is it metal? Bars and how is that going to be? Okay, I can show you. I can show you an, an image of what this would look like. But um, back to that. All right. So you have nimbies and bananas. Bananas are built absolutely nothing anywhere near anything, <laughs> and and not in my backyard. So that's the nice thing about building this around airports where you're commercial, is you're dealing with commercial people and a commercial problem. All right, and. Uh, it costs hotel operators two dollars and seventy six cents a passenger mile to run those three shuttle vans. So let's take let's take each of you and let me see a show of hands on this question. Okay, you're staying in an airport hotel, and you got to catch a flight in the morning. You can look at the phone app on your phone and see that you're seven minutes from when you walk down to the lobby, taking the J pods to when you'll be at your terminal. Or you can take and I'm going to charge you five bucks. Or you could take the free shuttle van and it might even be sit the youth there. How many people would take the free shuttle van or how many would that be, how many people would pay five bucks and go in a J5 vehicle right now as opposed to waiting for the shuttle van? All right. Yeah. All right. A mom with and and I'm gonna and it's gonna cost me nine cents of operating cost to make that trip. So it becomes a very profitable network to pay back. All right. So we can't go into your neighborhood and build one of these because we're going to get killed if we do that. The same thing is, as we say, we will never use our eminent domain to drive this because there's no sense in creating that fear 
we will only go where we're aggressively wanted and we will try to stay in the beginning in high commercial areas because I can haul drunk people from hotels to convention centers, dance clubs, uh, you know, and there's a, a, there is a multi billion, billion dollar market in building those networks around airports and convention centers. That doesn't make me have to go out in the neighborhoods. And by the time this sorts out in 10 years, you will see all this divergence coming back into highly focused standards. All right. I don't think I'm, 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 I am in love with my next idea, not what I did yesterday. So if we come up with better ideas, we'll tear down what we did two years ago and replace it. We will make the stuff that goes in the ground very durable. And we have a removal bond built into our agreements with cities that says, if we fail for any reason, we had to already have paid to have our stuff taken down. Okay, so you got to take the risk out of this for governments, or they won't do it. But if anybody wants copies of this documents and you want to help get it built in your city, let me know because I'd love to. Uh, I mean, we need to build a human network to build digital networks. This is a massive opportunity. This is the internet in 1982 all over again. Except for we know how it works. We know how it diverged and how it converged and diverged and converged around different standards. Yes, sir. Uh, getting back to you know nobody nobody wants to be the pioneer. Why not go to some, why not go to some places where you can really use it, like say uh, University of Texas at Austin, huge campus sprawling all over, or you know you go down to College Station. They got more buses there than have a port authority in, in Manhattan. You know, I and I've talked to universities and and their bus guys. All right, this is like Apple or this is like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs walking into IBM and say, "Hey, the world is going to be dominated by these PCs, not your big iron." And they've got the they got their the frameworks don't line up. So whenever I talk to a mass transit person, our framework and their framework aren't aligned all right that's why a toka is important is they said yes you can build yes we have a drone facility here we're going to make southeast oklahoma a, a center of high-tech stuff over the next day it's a big Not point but nice as soon as i get that certified my guess is we are building and playing largest mcdonald's in the world Frisco. So almost it is per person but it wouldn't surprise me that we break ground in both those cities yet this year. Can you talk a little about the business case for Itoka and, and yeah, so, what, so, the, what the story is doing big from the first conversation to now being a mass with the, with the <laughs> largest McDonald's in the world? What's that process been like in, in the world? Um, where we've gotten it signed? We used to be visible is, answers, yeah. Uh, where we've got it signed, we've got it signed so in China, Macon, Georgia, and, and Atoka, it's big. and at the top level, but not at the city level. Too right. Bigger than you think. And in all those cases business. where it's we got it done, business. it was. Is it, it's um, a That's not. Actually, is that thing amazingly, like, that's, a, no, that's not Atoka. You right. had somebody who said, sure, let's do that. And, and then we, what we did to make it available is we took their existing franchise uh, agreement that they yes, do right. sell companies. There's another and, big stuff. And, um, yeah, there's, uh, we just added in months, the state months, safety months. for great separated yeah. drill rides. So it's, it's something they already have on their books. And we just, it just couldn't happen. I and mean, it just was easy. And what was the, what was the business case in Itoka that supported there's no business case in it. Okay, so they're just wanting to experiment with, see how it no, develops. No, I, I want to find a place to build, and I keep commuting back and forth to Dallas, working on this project. And I was in a tow truck, and that's I ran into a guy that's, that's with it. the Choctaws, that's what and he said, "You want to talk to Carol over here?" And I went and talked to her, and she said, "Yeah, let me get the mayor." And it says, sure, Usually. let's do this and let's add it to our drone yeah, efforts. And yeah, we want to be a center of rollout. Around. And so, bam, it just, I mean, it just was that easy. Okay. 
in the, it's, the, it's, the it's, I think of it like we're hunting unicorns. We're trying to find a government that will allow innovation. We've presented this. San Jose has done two requests for quotes on this thing. 2008, 19 of us put bids in and said, we'll do this at no cost to the government. The city government there just used it to go get a federal grant for $4 million so that they could study the idea. New Jersey, 2007 passed, uh, or 2004 passed a law mandating DOT, NJDOT study this. The, the study was done by Booz Allen Hamilton, which is a pretty reputable um, consulting agency. They said that this thing was going to mushroom uh, by 2010. And then we got it passed. The city, the town of Secaucus, New Jersey, passed this. We had money lined up. NJDOT would not allow us to cross their rights of way. And the capital says, if we can't cross their rights of way, we're not funding this. So it's it's a it's a unicorn problem. If we just have to find a government that will allow innovation and we got one in Atoka, we're going to keep the network small enough that we can get it built right now. How big is the track you're planning to put there? The first one, okay, 300 okay. meters. Okay. So you're not talking about a mile? No. Nope. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a certification guidebook. Okay. It needs to cross the road. Are you going to cross over 69? I'm going to try to cross over 69. but if, And the good thing about out. Atoka, all right, so here's another part of the unicorn yeah. thing, is the Speaker of the House in Oklahoma, it's his district. So I know this. I know the head of the Republican Party in there. I've talked to Stitt about this thing, but um, we've got we got and the con. Uh, so we've got some we, it, fortunes are lining up. And a token, if we go, if it costs us five hundred five million bucks to do that, that is cheap relative to how much money I've burned up in over the last 25 years on this thing. So getting that certified is a big deal. Now, I just did a quick Google. It looks like there are two industrial parks in Atoka. Yeah. Are you planning to connect the two together? And then my question beyond that is, are they on different sides of the, of the highway? Yeah, they're on different sides. So and the one to, to the north is not my favorite one. Right. The one where, but, I think what we end up doing is, is I'm going to try really hard to do this down by Rebus Place so that we get people chatting about it right along 75. When do your patents run out and what are you going the to do? Is to I have the a lot more is patents pending. My primary Tulsa one and expired last year. So yeah. the invention yeah. of solar power transportation yeah. networks That's what I was expired last year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have, yeah, I have a ton more patents Sorry. And, and I've got some patent pending. That's why I was just trying to look. So that's interesting, too, from a commercial because, yes, Google, perspective once, as well. Once we build the first network, all right, yeah. on that list of articles that I showed you was the one from Fortune Magazine, $100 billion going well, nowhere, talking about how much money well, is being spent on fast, self driving cars. Right. Not going anywhere. Like, is there some parts that are slow? I don't speed Apple when I cross the. And Google the speed are traps. going to realize that and speed traps. This is just another I've been pulled over now. for not speeding my lot. And they're going to say that driving on the analog road is the wrong answer. Yeah. Driving on grade separated guidebooks is the right answer. Here. And they're going to shift gears and jump yeah, into this. Yeah. And then we're yes. going to get to the Take it to the I don't know if I was not paying attention or not, but I, I think one of the things that you need to emphasize is the fact that this network is completely covered with solar panels. Yeah. Right, so we're getting sixty thousand vehicle miles of power per mile of guideway per day. So when oil prices start to rise, if if apartment complexes are tied to their jobs, they don't have to. They don't, they're not going to be out of jobs because they couldn't afford gas. This stuff is going to get deployed really fast. We're going to be in a desperate situation with rising gas prices. I mean, in 2008, I briefed McCain's and Obama's Senate staff and campaign staff, showing them how people were using their mortgage payments to buy gas to keep their jobs. And both both Senate staff, only Bud McFarland, the former National Security Advisor, 
saw the problem, but he couldn't get the team's campaign staff to do anything about it. And then uh, but all the other staff thought that the federal government could manage the foreclosure problem. And then September, the whole bank didn't manage. So, oh. Great. 